Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott, and as always, I'm alongside my co-host, Dan. How are you doing, Dan? Yeah, yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Uh, both fresh off the Great North Swim last weekend, which went really well. Some pretty tough conditions with it being really choppy, but it was good. Mm. Well done to anyone else who swam, uh, who basically joined us last weekend. Uh, and thank you very much for everyone who donated towards our swim. It was a great cause, and we really did mm. enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. It's a cause very close to our hearts. Um, we put the link in our last podcast. It, we'll put it again in this podcast if anyone is interested in knowing a little bit more. But on this week's episode, we have another fantastic guest for you all. Um, now, we've spoken to his brother, Joe, earlier in, what was it, last year? Last October, something like that, for yeah, ISL. Yeah. Last week, we spoke to his girlfriend, Sarah. So I sincerely hope we haven't offended him by speaking to him last. Um, otherwise, this might be a very fast chat, but welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, Max Litchfield. How are you doing, Max? I'm good, guys. I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. And congratulations last weekend at the Great Last Swim. Awesome stuff. Yeah, it was fun. It was a, a different experience from the pool and one I'm, I'm very much carrying on with. I love open water now. I'm with it. As long as it's not choppy like it was, because it felt like a sea <laughs> swim. It was honestly, it was, some bits were really bad, but it was actually a really good day. The weather was nice. So yeah, no complaints, really. Very nice, very nice. There's loads that we kind of want to talk to you about, Max, because the, you've had a really interesting journey since Rio. We'll touch a little bit upon Rio, and then I think I am swimming. I think we want to learn a little bit more during this podcast about what it takes to be an I am swimmer and sort of the training that you go through because it is four different strokes. It's, you can't really specialize down in your training to one. So I think... If everyone listens for the whole podcast, hopefully they'll learn something along the way as well. Um, so. <laughs> so if if we start off with Rio, you finished fourth, which was an amazing, amazing achievement. And most people would love just to get to the Olympics. But fourth place is often known as the worst place to finish. How did you feel after finishing just outside the medals? Yeah, um, Rio for me was a weird one, I guess. Um, you know, going into... Well, going into 2016 in general, um, I had my sights set on, on going to the Olympics, um, but it was kind of like a, an outside shot. You know, I remember at the trials, no one really was talking about me. Um, you know, I had Dan Dan Wallace and Roberto Pavoni ahead of me and uh, well, even, maybe even like Lewis Smith and stuff. I was, I was probably further back than him. And um, it wasn't even, you know, no one, no one beforehand would have said I was going to, you know, go to the Olympics. And um, I think that kind of changed how my feelings were going into, into the summer. You know, I, I knew whatever I got out of, of the games, it was going to be a positive because, you know, I had no pressure on me. It was, um, you know, it was a learning experience no matter what. Um, and then to go there and swim a PB in the heats and then swim another PB in the final. Um, yes, in coming fourth, which was frustrating. Um, but, you know, when I, when I, remember, I remember finishing and looking up and, seeing fourth and I was really really shocked and actually really happy um mm. because of the you know the things I've just mentioned that I did I didn't really have any expectations and um and it wasn't that close um Mark the difference between me and Sato in third was like 1.4 seconds or something I guess if it had been on the touch it might have been a different situation I might have been more disappointed but um it was a very good swim for me um and one that you know I look back really fondly on um and was it was a great like kickstarter to my you know my proper senior international career yeah how have how have you had to change your approach now since then because like you said going into Rio you were the underdog no one really expected much of you now you're a little bit more of a marked man you've got faster pbs you're up there around the podium at major events how much has that changed how you're training and motivating yourself going into Tokyo in terms of training like there's no nothing different you know I you know, I pride myself on working really hard and, and doing everything I can to, you know, to be the best swimmer I can and, and, and ultimately be the fastest swimmer I can. And, um, so that's not really changed. You know, I still have the exact same work ethic I did back at Sheffield and back in 2016, 17. And, um, 
I guess it's just the difference in, you know, that people do notice you and people do have some sort of expectations of you um, more than they did back in, in 2016. Um, but it still doesn't change anything, really. It just means that, you know, people uh, are out, you know, are watching you more intently than necessarily they were back then, um, which to some extent is a good thing. Um, so yeah, nothing massively has changed in terms of that. It's just a different, yes, you know, different angle that you, you approach the race from. And, um, yeah, not, not massively different in terms of both those things really. Mm. So do you feel more pressure because you are the number one British foreign Jaiama? I guess so. Yeah. Like, I guess, I mean, you know, you, I want to keep that, that, that title of, you know, of being the, the best foreign medley swimmer in, in Britain and, um, you know, over the last couple of years, my 200 medley has not been as good as it was. And, you know, I had that mantle a couple of years back and, you know, several people have gone past me now and, you know, great, great swimmers like Duncan Scott has been absolutely flying and, mm. um, you know, mm. rightfully so he's, he's now got the British record because it was an un- unbelievable swim in, uh, in London. But yeah, I guess it does create more pressure, but again, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference necessarily to, to how I go about, about things. Mm. Um, it's just a different mindset going into the race. Um, you know, knowing that you're being chased by people as opposed to chasing people down, if mm. that makes sense. Um, but you know, you're still in there to compete and you're still in there to race and you've got to, you know, you've got to do your best swim and, and in either, in either, in either scenario. Yeah. Yeah. So we said kind of to start things off that we touch upon what it's like to train as a 400 IM swimmer. So let's kind of jump straight into it. How tough is it not allowing yourself to have a weak stroke? Yeah, it's really tough. Um, and well, I'm saying it's tough, but my weak stroke is breaststroke and it is pretty <laughs> weak. Um, <laughs> but like, it is something that you have to really work on. And, and the breaststroke has kind of like let me down a lot recently um, in the last couple of years. It's been the stroke where you know, I've always kind of dropped too far back or... Um, mm just not been able to stick with the pack or, or you know, it's, it's one that has really plagued me. And, um, but I guess the same goes for everything else. Like I pride myself on being a really good back end swimmer. And at times I've tried to go out faster so that, you know, I can try and stay ahead of people on the breaststroke, mm. which then affects my freestyle, which is my main stroke. And, you know, I'm coming back in like a minute or 59, which is, you know, it's, it's a solid split, but it's not good enough for, for what I can do. Mm. Um, so it's finding that real good balance between all the strokes as well. That's really important. That's something I think over the last couple of months and well, weeks and months really since kind of trials that's, that's really helped me. And I think, you know, bouncing on from Europeans to, to well, trials to Europeans to Glasgow, I think um, the reason I was swimming as fast, if not faster in those meets was than trials when I was rested was that, you know, I have found that perfect, like kind of balance between the strokes and mm. the way I need to pace an event and, and go out there and, um, and swim it. So I guess that coming back to like your initial question about how like hard it is to to train for a medley event, it's tough. Like you know, you have to you have to be world class at all all four strokes and um, you know all the skills, all the turns. Um, you know, like we were doing turns this morning. And I was just doing breast to breast turns, and then you know you spend twenty minutes trying to work on a turn, and then you're like, oh, I've got six more to to focus on now. Like it's mm. it's hard to. I know obviously some of them are translatable. Like you've got similarities between a breast to breast and a fly to fly but mm. like there's there's a lot a lot more goes into it obviously than just doing a freestyle event so um yeah it's tough but you know i love doing the 400 i am and um it's my it's my main event and my mm. favorite event maybe i don't know if <laughs> thing on 400 i am but like the event i'm best at so um i'm stuck with it <laughs> um but yeah it, it's tough but you know i love it and, and it's what i do and um you don't get any breaststroke tips off sarah then <laughs> um bit of a different stroke to, to what mine is i think <laughs> uh, i wish i did though i wish i did but that's like it's something it's something i have like looked at like not necessarily looking at sarah but looking at guys like will be um and you know dave's been amazing the last few years at coaching breaststroke because he's got molly he's got will be he's got you know abby's unbelievable yeah. breaststroke and um like that's one thing that has you know we've been trying to work on for the last two or three years since i've been in loughborough and um, you know, hopefully we've kind of found the, the, the right recipe for that as well now. So do you find it hard to kind of step away from training? It's kind of a weird question, but you, like you said, you're practicing your breaststroke drills for 
or your breaststroke turns for 20 minutes and then you, you've got another six to work on. Do you find it hard leaving the pool, especially when it's not, say, a threshold set or something like that? When it is technical, I mean, you could spend hours, hours and hours perfecting each stroke, whereas most people just have to do one. Is there a limit to, or do you kind of have to give yourself a mental break and step away? How hard is that? Yeah, I think like at the pool itself, like you've got to be, you've got to make sure you're not just going too intense or not too intense, but being too like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like Obsessive. focusing on too, too much at once. Yeah. Mm. Um, like this one, I only did focus on breast to breast and a little bit back to breast. Like I'm not then going to, you know, end up staying an hour, an hour and a half longer. The way we plan with Dave, you know, we make sure that throughout the week we get in, you know, a, a, a key set focusing on everything that we need to focus on. Um, mm. It might not necessarily be, you know, a session where you're focusing specifically on every turn or every stroke or whatever, but you get in over the 10 sessions or whatever it is in the week. Um, a good a good proportion of that is focusing on, especially the bits that, that are my weaker parts of my medley. Um, so that by the time you get to the end of the week, you can say you, you've ticked boxes on all these this, this, these different scenarios and different skills mm. and stuff. Um, and then you're not like, you know, you're not panicking about, oh, I haven't done enough of that or I haven't done enough of this. Um, but yeah, it is hard at times, especially when, well, for me, it's something I really struggle with in terms of stepping away from the pool when you get away from the pool, if that makes sense. Like mm. for years, I've just, you know, swimming has been what well, is my life, but it's really hard to switch off from that sometimes. And mm. it's a really key thing that I've had to learn and um, has helped me. Like, you know, I just live swimming all the time, which is a great thing. But at the same time, it's a really bad thing because you just don't switch off and you get too intense and you overthink everything. And um, it's not healthy, really. It's not good for you. Um, you need to find that balance again with 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 both of those things. Yeah, because I've been watching um, Head Above Water on Amazon and um, they were talking about Carl Chalmers and he doesn't want to stay inside the sport. Otherwise, it, like, it kills you, basically, if you're too mentally invested all the time. So he has his, his little hobbies of reptiles and stuff like that. So I think it's quite important <laughs> to, to have hobbies on the side. Um, I think we spoke to Hannah Miley. She used to do rock climbing and all that sort of stuff. So it just takes your mind away from it. And I think that's probably the best thing to do. Yeah, I agree. You need, you need stuff that you... You know, that you focus on and can take your mind off things outside of the pool. Mm. Now, in 2018, you suffered what was quite a bad shoulder injury, and it took you a long time to get back to fitness. How difficult was that to get back to full training in the pool to start with? Because it's a, it's been a long journey, hasn't it? Yeah, like um, at first, it was so it happened just before Worlds, actually, 2017. Um, okay, and I managed to get through Worlds. Um, that was obviously when I saw my, my, my PBs. Um, so I managed to get through that quite well. Um, and then that was kind of, at that point, I was like, you know what? It's not hurting now. I've got through this period. Mm. Had a few weeks off after Worlds. And I was like, you know what? Well, that's normal. We're good. Um, and then we're on like a train. You know, we got back from a training camp, like a pre-season training camp, um, just before I was going to altitude. And then um, it kind of reared its head again. Um, and then that's that's when it was like, it was pretty tough at that point because I remember speaking to Bill um, and he basically said to me that potentially it could end my career. Like he was like, this could be, Blimey. you know, this, if, if we don't sort this out, like this could be, you know, you could never, maybe not like I'm never going to swim again, but you may never get back to, back to the best. level you swam at, you know, in 2017. Um, and that kind of hit home and like, not that I wanted to prove Bill wrong, but I wanted, <laughs> you know, I wanted to do everything that I could to make sure that that didn't happen because, you know, mm. swimming, like I said, swimming was, is my life. And, um, you know, I didn't want to, that I didn't want that to be the end of my story at that point. Um, but it was really tough. You know, there was, there was times where, um, I just didn't see improvement from that period. End of 2017, I missed European short course, um, end of 2017. Um, and obviously went on to miss Commonwealth games in 2018, but I didn't, I didn't really see any improvement for like for months really it was it was only end of january um so through like what's that three three or four months later that i started to see improvement mm. um and i guess like everyone you know when people say it it's like oh it's a whole year i missed it wasn't it wasn't a whole year i missed like it was probably a whole year from where it first started to when i finally got back to to where i wanted to in that summer of 2018 mm. um 
but like everything that went on in that year, it was just full on. I was like, you know, we went, went out to altitude in, in January and that's when things started to get better. And, you know, I couldn't swim at first. So I was on the bike for two hours, do that two hour walk back sessions and then I'd do rehab. And then in the afternoon I'd do two hours while everyone was swimming and I'd do more rehab and I'd do gym in the day. And it was like just constant because I was like, I need to get back to, to like, to, to being able to swim again. And, you know, I did my first lens out there um, that I'd done since like, well, probably October, November time um, without any sort of pain. Um, and then slowly built up from there and then obviously made it back for, for 2018. But it was really tough. And, you know, for any swimmers out there that are going through injury troubles and stuff, like just don't don't let it like consume you. Don't let it defeat you. Like it can seem really, really hard at times, but you just, if you've got the people around you that know what you know what you need to do, uh, like believe in them and, and believe in the process. And, you know, it might feel like, like to me, it feels like longer than what it was. Um, mm because it was so hard at times, but, you know, stick at it and keep doing those things. Um, and, you know, eventually you'll, you'll get to that point where you can, you can finally say it's, it's history. Yeah. Cause I think sometimes injuries is more of a mental hindrance than it is a physical one. Cause you see other one in the, in the pool training hard and you can see them getting better time-wise and then you're off basically on the sidelines for the best part of two years. Uh, it must've been tough mentally. So yeah. Um, we're going to ask about advice later on, but, um, before that, what kind of rehab exercises did you do in the gym or in the pool or whatever? There was all sorts. Like, the, I started straight away, like, getting stuff on. So I said to, like, my, well, I said to my coach and I said to my S&T coach, I was like, right, well, I can't swim, so I'm going to do bike sessions. So, I, you know, I did loads of testing on the bike um, to, like, get my thresholds and VO2 um, stats and stuff. So I kind of had a baseline of, you know, what, I would have in the pool because I've done it for years and know what I'm, know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then kind of my, my, my SNC coach then just wrote a whole program for me. So I was doing like a, probably, well, probably doing about 10 cycle sessions a week, basically. Um, oh man. I ended up coming out of it, like looking like Chris Hoy. Well, I didn't. Oh, <laughs> my, legs, my legs, my legs were huge. Um, like 28, end of 20, uh, start of 2018. Cause I'd just been on the bike so much. Mm. Um, so that was the first step, like making sure I was fit. Like that's, you can lose fitness so quickly and you know it's not quite the same as swimming but it, it, mm. it keeps you very fit just cycling and that was the only thing I could really do to keep my aerobic fitness going um and then it was a matter of kind of like we didn't really know what the issue was at first um and it took a lot of experimenting and you know, we talked about surgery and it was it was finding out what was actually the issue um mm. which was which obviously then is difficult to prescribe rehab for because you don't know what the issue is yeah so at first it was kind of playing around with it and then um I didn't really know what the right thing to do was and then we got into January and I went like I said I went to altitude and was working with uh, one of the British swimming physios and we just kind of hit hit the nail on the head really I was doing all sorts of strengthening stuff with my shoulder um, working in all sorts of different ranges I got this uh, I don't know if you probably won't have heard of it, like a body blade it's like a big long stick basically that wobbles um okay. and like I, I so you like you'd start like by your side and then you move your way up and you oh, um, okay yeah, yeah yeah but like I couldn't do it like my left my right arm I could kind of do it my left arm like I'd get to like a, like five de- five degrees of um external rotation and my arm would just I just couldn't do it I might just freeze oh wow um and like now I do that every day and it's not a, it's not an issue in the world um, that was one of the things I think that, that worked so well, um, you know, just keeping on top of it with all the little strengthening stuff, for the rotator cuff muscles and making sure it was strong in all the ranges. Um, and that, you know, I wasn't going to have, because the, the the issue in the first place really was that I wasn't strong enough in those smaller muscles. So it was strengthening all those muscles. So, you know, it's things with TheraBands um, that yeah. obviously you don't need to do that necessarily, but it worked really well for me. Um, but, yeah, the rehab stuff is so important. I know we said we'll speak about advice, but you need to do rehab stuff. You need to do from a young age. Um, I think from my perspective, if I had done the things, those sort of things at a younger age when I was supposed to, and I've been told to, but didn't, I might not have been in that situation. You never know. Like mm-hmm. it could have still happened, but you know, it's mid, it's like risk mitigation, isn't it? It's reducing that risk of it happening. And I think um, that's one thing I look back on and, 
I'm basically king of pre-pool now and everyone takes the mick out of me for it, but it's, <laughs> I need to do it. Otherwise I'll get injured again. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, so are we looking at basically warm ups and shoulder mobility and you, you now obviously take that super seriously to prevent that sort of injuries from happening. I know me and Dan have talked about swimmer shoulders, but the best thing yeah. you can do is get that pre-pool sorted as soon as possible and as quick as possible. Yeah, exactly. It's keeping it going every day and, my shoulders are actually touch wood really good now. Like there's, mm. you know, I keep on top of it every day, but there's no, there's no real issues. With them. You know, I get soreness and tightness every now and again, but what, what's what athlete, what swimmer doesn't. Mm. Um, but it's like my hips are now an issue. My hips have been a bit of an issue for the last couple of years as well with, I think with the breast strokes I've been trying to work on. <laughs> um, but again, now I've, I've finally worked out like what the right thing is for me that helps, mm. that stops it, you know, getting worse. And again, it's, it's repetition of the stuff every day. So I make sure that every day I get a shoulder hit. Well, every session I get a shoulder hit and a hip hit um, before I get into the pool. Um, and then after, like I've just been in, in the lounge now, just doing some like stretching stuff and getting my ball into my legs and just making sure that, you know, it takes a lot of time. Like there's, you know, you end up having not, not a lot of time in the day because you're doing so much of this, this rehab stuff, but it is so, so important. Yeah. I mean, I was going to, that was the next question actually was how important is the foam rolling and stretching? Cause I know swimmers will find it really boring and monotonous, but how do you, how do you make it more interesting when you know it's so important to do? Yeah, I think, I think it can be tough to make it interesting. Um, that that's like the truth of it. Like it is a bit boring, but you kind of mm. just have to get your head around that, you know, for 45 minutes, an hour of the day, you are going to have a little bit of boring stretching and, and pre pull and, you know, I basically do the same exercises every day, twice a day. So it does get boring, but it's just something you have to do. If you don't, you know, you might be really lucky and go through your career and never get injured, but do you want to run the risk of of that of it not happening? Like, I, I again, if, if, if you'd have told me that 10 years ago, I would have made sure I did it properly. Yeah, I mean, I know people say it's boring and monotonous to do the same thing every day, but it, it's almost like starting a routine. It's like... I don't, I don't know about you, Dan, because I know you don't do this. But for me, it's like having my morning coffee every day. I, I do that without fail and I don't get bored of that. So if you enjoy <laughs> swimming that much and you know that you need to do these things to keep you fit and healthy, then it, it doesn't get boring. It almost sets you up for that session and focuses your mind slightly. Just play yeah. a song or something while you're doing it. That would work, wouldn't it? <laughs> Three or four minutes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Even like now, I just watch, sit and watch TV while I've got my ball into my hip and stretching like... You can, I guess you can find different ways to make it less boring, but mm. you know, there's going to be a bit of monotony to it, but it is what it is. Mm. Um, I, I guess to be fair, like in, in the situation where we were in, in January of 2018, when we were on that altitude camp, the physio there was awesome at making it quite interesting for me, I guess, doing the things like the body blade, it's different. Mm. Um, we were doing stuff on like, um, I don't know what you'd call them, but like weird, like, I guess like a TRX, but not. And like, I was like trying to stabilize myself on them and we're playing like this weird game with a ball where we'd like throw it against, he loves ball sports. And it was like, <laughs> I don't know what he calls it, but it was just stuff that was a bit different, um, mm. but still was working my shoulder in like weird ranges. Um, so like, yeah, th there are ways of doing it and making it more interesting. It's just, you know, trying to be creative with that, but um, like prepare yourself for a bit of monotony, but mm. it's worth it in the end. Yeah. If a swimmer is struggling with injury already and it's really starting to get them down, what advice would you give them to keep their motivation or, or gain more motivation to keep going? I think, like I said before, just keeping, keeping a focus, well, I didn't say this before, A, keep like, um, keep at it, stick at it and make sure you're, you know, you're not kind of, well, you will get down and you will have days where you're like, oh, this is just not working. This is a waste of time. But know that, if you keep sticking at what you're doing and what you've been told to do, it will get better. Mm. Um, but then I think having a goal in mind, like kind of what I said with Bill, you know, he said, you might not get back from this. So then I, my goal immediately was like, right, I need, well, I'm going to get back from this. Like my goal is to be back swimming mm. and you need to, I guess you need to set a, like with anything, you need to set short, medium, long-term goals. Like yeah. at first it was like, right, well I can, I, like my first goal is to be like what well, swimming a length because I couldn't at, that, at one point. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you build it up from there, you start swimming fly because obviously fly is going to be way worse on your shoulder and, um, you know, build up those little goals so that then eventually you get back to doing a race or, or whatever that might be. And, 
and then I guess like setting other goals that like, I really enjoyed the bike like I like I said before I you know I kind of became a cyclist for um for like five six months and I, I found like I found myself really enjoying these cycling sessions and they were horrible some of them but I really enjoyed that and that kind of gave me that buzz that it gives me when I do a hard set and I do a really good hard set and um that kind of translated into the cycling stuff as well um so yeah I guess like goal setting you know keep a focus on what, where you want to get back to or where you want to get to um like don't let those um the bad days like get you down too much they, they you know at times they, they will be bad but you know keep pushing through those bad days and then I guess like using the people around you like making sure you you are talking to people and um mm. friends family coaches you know support staff whatever that is um and talk to them about how if it is a bad day or and then I guess like switching off and stuff as well um you know if you can if you do have a hobby or you can find a hobby that change like switches you off from swimming yeah. and from your injury then brilliant because you know you're not yeah. stressing about it and it's not like consuming you yeah yeah i think that's some really helpful advice that especially younger kids kind of need to know so if we touch upon your recent performances um myself and dan on our live streams and all of our kind of reviews we've been seeing recently that actually you're one of the form gb swimmers and what really impressed us, especially kind of Glasgow, was your results in events that weren't the 4IM. So the 2-3, the 4-3, mm. um, and the 2IM, they've been really, really impressive. Uh, I mean, the 4-3, you only just missed the consideration time. I think it would have been crazy to do both of those at the Olympics, given they're back-to-back. Yeah. Same it's session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How... How does swimming different events like that come into your training routine and how much confidence does it give you when you're swimming a fast 400 free? Yeah, massively. Um, I mean, like for me anyway, like my staple events really are the 2-4-AM and the 2-4-3. Um, I guess like with the 4-3, I've not really focused on it the last couple of years because like you say, I know it's, it's day one, day clash. two of Olympics and it's kind of like, well, I'm not going to swim the 4-3 because... I want to swim the 4 a.m., um, mm. which is why I didn't swim it at trials. So, like, it's just one of those that's – it's a bit of an annoying clash, but it is what it is. Um, but, like, yeah, I mean, you know, swimming in season at Glasgow and, and Europeans and stuff, like, kind of like I said before, I think I've made some really good changes in terms of mentally how I go about the race um, and technically in terms of the stuff I've been doing in training with Dave um, and all the other support staff there in, in Loughborough and – I think they just it just shows straight away, like you know, just such tiny differences I made from Europeans like a week and a half later into Glasgow, and um, you know we didn't we didn't back off in that that week and a half. It's a lot, not a long period of time to get a big training block in, but like the, those technical changes and tactical changes that I made um, is why I think I swam better than I expected to um, in uh, in Glasgow and it's amazing to be doing that and it's, it gives me really good confidence obviously leading into the summer and um you know i've only got 400 am there but it gives me great confidence in, in what i can do um come the olympics yeah i mean talking about glasgow you beat joe in the 200 am uh is there a bit of friendly rivalry or competition that goes on between you two or was it uh was it was it quite nice to get one over on him it was nice to beat him again um <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's, there always is. Like we're always, you know, we're always trying to beat each other. You know, I've, I've said in the past, like for years and years, Joe has been like, we've always been like a set distance away from each other. And we've only been able to like compare on like when we're younger, like what our PBs were at a certain age or, you yeah. know, if Joe took one of my darts records or anything like that. Um, but, you know, like now we're on a level playing field really. And, um, you know, he's obviously still younger than me, but um, like, it's just two brothers going at it and you know we we do obviously train together and we've always trained together so um it's it, there is a rivalry there but it's not it's it's not on uh, like it's not a bad rivalry it's just a, a friendly rivalry and we don't really take the, the, the mick out of each other too much about it mm. um mm. you know like you know obviously i want to beat him and he wants to beat me and at times it does cost you places on teams and medals and stuff like you know obviously beat me at trials on the 2am and um, I was over the moon for him that he, you know, he qualified in that event for, for his first Olympics. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you kind of have to switch off that he's your brother while you're racing. And then, you know, once you finish, you're like, oh, well, you know, he is my brother. So 
well done. Um, like it's a weird situation, but um, you know it's amazing that he's able to swim so fast and he's you know, he's got rewards for for his hard work over the last few years. And um, yeah, how are your parents doing? Because obviously, two brothers qualify for Tokyo. Unfortunately, they can't fly out and see you. Mm, um, they must still be over the moon. Yeah, no, they're they're so so proud, and you know we we give so much thanks to them for for all the hard work they put in when. Uh, when we were younger and you know all the early mornings and late nights and traveling on weekends and the amount of sacrifices they would have had to make um for, for us to, to to be sitting here today and um you know it's just so immensely um you know thankful to them and um they are really proud and obviously it's a shame that they can't can't fly out to tokyo but they'll be they'll be cheering us on from from here yeah I mean, you leave for Tokyo soon, don't you? Like a couple of weeks now. Um, yeah. How's, how's your preparation gone? Has it gone to plan? Are you exactly where you want to be in training? Yeah, really good, to be honest. Like, like obviously, it's been a kind of a weird cycle. We've been, you know, trials and then a few weeks, Europeans, a couple of weeks in Glasgow. And then, you know, we've now got, a, this is the only real block of training, proper training um, that we can we can put in. And we're in like the first week and a half of that now. And um, everything's going well. Um you know, the fact that we have had such good racing um, and such good preparation meets is is a massive confidence boost, like I said. And, um, you know, a lot of the time that is where, you know, over the, over the last couple of years, I've maybe not, not raced enough, even pre-COVID. Um, and we get a lot out of, of racing and, and, and to, to race fast in season is amazing for me because I don't normally do that. So um, huge confidence boost. And yeah, just, just you know, getting stuck into these last couple of weeks of, of tough training now. And then it's, um, you know, all guns guns blazing for, for Tokyo and, and taper. Mm. Now I'm going to put you on the spot slightly before we end, because I'm not sure about Dan's list, but on my list, you're definitely down as a bit of a dark horse for a medal. And I think you could be GB's first medal on the day. So is, is that well within your reach? Is that the target for Tokyo now? Yeah, well, that's, that's been my, that has been my target. Even you know since Rio, I, almost immediately after I said, well, I've got four years to prepare and, you know, I can hopefully go one better or, or more in, in, in Tokyo. And um, it's certainly the goal, you know, there's, there's guys swimming fast all around the world right now. Um, even today, one of the French guys has been 409. Um, so there's been, there's guys swimming fast, um, but, you know, you've got to swim fast to win Olympic medals. So um, I've just got to put my best race together. Um, you know, the stuff I'm seeing in, in season training and stuff, all points towards, um, you know, swimming fast. Um, but it's just going to be a, a really good race. Um, and yeah, hopefully I can come out in the medals, but you know, we'll see, I've just got to give it my all and then, um, you know, we'll see what we get out of it. Do you always keep an eye out for other competitors around the world? Cause of course you've got the U S trials going now and the Aussie trials. Do you always keep an eye out for what they're doing? Yeah, definitely. I've been watching Aussie and U S trials and, uh, keeping up with those guys. And, you know, I like, I, I, I do love swimming a bit of a swim nerd really. So, um, you know, I, I do try and keep up with it as much as I can. And, um, yeah, I've been watching obviously intently and the, the medley guys and stuff and seeing what times they're swimming. And, um, you know, like I said, there's a, there is a, a bunch of us on four ten, four eleven now. Um, mm. so it's pretty, pretty tightly packed. Um, going to be a fast heat for sure in, in, in Tokyo, uh, being an evening as well. Um, yeah. but you know, it's, it's just going to be a race. It's going to be a race to, to get your hand on the wall first and, um, book yourself a spot in that final and then it's, it's anyone's game. So, um, yeah, exciting times. Definitely. I know, I know definitely I'm cheering for you. I know Dan is as well. Yeah, um, obviously. <laughs> b- before we end this podcast, I, there's something really important and positive. I, I want to touch upon that you're doing outside of the pool. Now you're using your platform and kind of this, not brand that you've built up, but your name to make a positive impact in the environment and carbon footprint. So how important is that topic for you? And and maybe just offer a few people listening some advice of how they can get involved with the sort of things that you're doing. Yeah, I, um, I've always kind of been conscious, like climate conscious. And, you know, ever since I was a kid, I tried to do everything that I thought was, was right. Um, it was kind of like lockdown, first lockdown last year, where I, I first kind of, Stumble, I stumbled upon a, a company um, that sell bamboo toothbrushes, basically. And that was the one thing that kind of really got me started on this journey. I saw a stat that was basically like every plastic toothbrush you've ever used in your life is still mm. like, mm. it's still intact today. And I was like, that's 
pretty mental considering you go through one every like what two three months probably less than that um and that was one thing that it just it blew my mind and then you know you start thinking about every everything else that is that you use day to day that is just in landfill today and it's still there um and then it just kind of spiraled from there really but um yeah i'm trying to do as much as i can um you know it's it's pretty hectic trying to fit it all in around training but i just try and do as much as i possibly can and hopefully try and you know inspire a couple of people to make a, a simple change and like i say it is it is a simple change it's like i say it's a change from a bamboo toothbrush a plastic toothbrush to a bamboo one um mm. like such a tiny thing but it makes a huge difference um little things like you know when you go to the supermarket picking up like loose veg it's not in you, know, you get bananas in plastic like there's bananas not in plastic but there's yeah, no need yeah, for the yeah. plastic there certain <laughs> things like a bag of salad leaves you need to have you know, there needs to be some sort of container for it. But, you know, when it's loose, things like that, like there's just no need for it. And it's something that you can like actively change. Like the supermarkets might not change that, but if you pick out the stuff that isn't in plastic, obviously it makes a huge difference. And um, there are so many different things that you can do. And, you know, like starting to follow certain like accounts on Instagram and stuff, there's so many little, so many little tips and changes that you can make out there. Um stuff like the litter pick we did earlier in the year. If, you know, if everyone mm-hmm. picked up a plastic bottle a day, like yeah. that's 8 million plastic bottles, 8 million, what am I about? 8 billion plastic bottles around the world. Like, mm, yeah. you know, the, the issue difference. is solved. I know it's not realistically possible for that to happen, but, you know, it makes a huge difference. It sounds tiny, but, you know, if everyone comes together and does little things differently, it'll make a huge, huge difference. And, um, yeah. Mm yeah i think what we'll do is we'll we'll speak to you off air and we'll um get some useful links that we can put in this cool. podcast description for everyone to follow and heed some advice and change the planet just a little bit and it, it needs doing cool definitely yeah, just a little change from everyone makes a huge difference like you said so i think it's, i think it's brilliant honestly mm-hmm. i really do oh, thanks guys so max before we end this podcast you might be aware from our previous episodes we do some quick fire questions you, do you feel up for these <laughs> I've been prepping for these. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that defeats well, one the of, objective one of slightly. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's kick things off with what's your favourite event? Well, I, I said it earlier, it was 4am, but I'm going to change it and say probably the two and the three. I think like to race, it's such a good event. And I think because it's so strong in Britain now as well, like mm. it's always a, always a good race. Um, you know, it's best event is 4am but i think to actually swim it i think two and a three who is your swimming idol uh it's really cliche but it is probably phelps like you know he's mm. from the what well, he's still the world record on the 4am like he's the best swimmer for a medley but best medley swimmer best all-round swimmer ever um and you know he was the he was the guy that i always watched growing up and i saw him winning so many medals at olympics and um yeah, it's kind of crazy. Like this year is the first time he won't be at an Olympic Games since what? 2000, since Sydney. Like, yeah. yeah, crazy, isn't it? Crazy. Mad. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, cliche, but Phelps. I mean, he races all the events that you do, so I'd be a bit surprised yeah. if you didn't, didn't yeah. see him, really. <laughs> um, what's your proudest moment in swimming? Um, that's a tough one. I think like, I think just competing in general for Team GB, like, I guess like an individual moment, I'd say like probably making my first Olympics, but then like making my second Olympics is pretty amazing too. So like, mm. I think just being able to, to you know, to stand behind the blocks and know you're wearing Team GB kit and you know, you're, you're representing your country is, is amazing. So I think, yeah, just all the times I get to, to race for, for Britain, really. What is the hardest set? you've ever done um this is going a long well not a long way back but back about five years um it was um 120 100s off 115 um long course uh it was my own is that, a, is that a russ barber set <laughs> well it is but i we we so like we did it i think he'd done it with curtain james curtain um, mm. he was a breaststroker and he's a nutter and he managed to do it. He did like 110, I think, off 120. And it was like yeah. Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve 2015. So he's joking, it was, it was Christmas, Christmas as well. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> um, 
it ruined my Christmas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> no, it was t- Christmas Eve 2015, and um, I think the night the night before or something, were it, Russ had always mentioned it that he'd done this, and like that it wasn't as hard as the stuff we'd ever done. So like literally the night before, um, we were like, all right, well, we're going to do 120 off 115. Um, and, oh yeah, and it was just it was so painful. I I just got to about 80, and I just I just collapsed, and I was dying, and I had to put my fins on and. I think the last one I went back a 112 with fins on. I was literally in a body bag. And then <laughs> I was I was in Sheffield, obviously, but I was going home for Christmas. And I was like, I was just on on poolside, like flat out. I just I couldn't move. I had people feeding me chocolate and stuff. And and then Russ was like, You can't drive home, like you just can't. Um so my poor mum had to come and pick me up from Sheffield <laughs> oh, <laughs> from <man>. Christmas Eve <laughs> to take me. Um not good, not good. But that yeah, that was that was just minging. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that sounds pretty rough. Yeah. Um, final question: If you were to go on a road trip, three spaces in the car—they could be friends, family, or celebrities. Who would you have? Oh, this is what I've been thinking about, and it's tough. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I'm a big sports fan, so I'm going Joe Root because I love cricket. You might not know this one. I'm going Nikola Jokic. He is uh, he plays for the Denver Nuggets. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. NBA, and they're my team. And he's a MVP. Legend. MVP. Yeah, this year. Um, got kicked out of the playoffs, but um, yeah, he's a good, he's a good guy. And um, <laughs> well, Sarah said me last week, so I'm gonna have to say Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> gonna have to. <laughs> She's gonna sit quiet in the corner because she doesn't like sport. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, Max, it's been so much fun speaking to you. I've I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. Dan, how about you? I've learned lots, and especially the old, the whole injury thing. Because I was really, I was one of those swimmers that never got injured because I was always one bit like you. I was, I always did the rehab with the resistance bands and the pre-pool and all that sort of stuff. So it's really good that you're giving advice to the younger swimmers who are hopefully listening to this. And uh, mm. yeah, no, it's really good advice. So amazing. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for coming on, Max. And yeah, good luck for Tokyo now. It's not far away Mm. at all. Not far away at all. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, cheers, Max. Thank you. Brilliant. So that rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. Little bit of news before we end things is that for the next two weeks we have, or for the next week, we have three more episodes coming. We're going to be reviewing Aussie Trials, then American Trials, and then we're going to have a really fun podcast about the ISL draft where me and Dan give a go a draft in our own isl teams that's going to be fun it's going to be fun you've got to teach me about the draft to to begin with but picking summers will be all right but yes yeah (laughs) i'll do that so if you haven't subscribed already to the propulsion swim podcast you can do so on youtube apple Podcasts, or spotify for myself scott i will see you next week and we'll catch you on next one guys you've been listening to the propulsion swimming podcast with scott and dan We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.